thank you all for being here. It's my honor to be a Compton lecturer. This is a very historic and wonderful tradition here at the University of Chicago. And I'm excited to be part of it. To tell you about cool things we're doing with stars that die and explode in magnificent and fascinating ways, and creating the elements, the building blocks that we're all made of. But before we even get there, I want to backtrack a little bit and uh, tell you how we get there. Because, you know, to get to an explosion, to get to a star, dying in some fascinating way, first you have to have a star. So, I, didn't give you, I would like to give you a little bit of uh, background on how the stars are born and evolve and get to the point where they produce this magnificent special explosion. So, the first lecture is going to be the path to this explosive stellar death. And I'm going to describe you the basics of stellar evolution. How stars get there. Can you turn the lights down? Yeah, let's see. I can do that. Oh. I don't seem to have control over that. You do. It's somewhere in there. Okay. <laughs>
dense parts of the nebula occasionally will be disturbed and they will collapse under the influence of gravity. And they will keep collapsing, they will keep collapsing, things will get denser and hotter, and matter is going to, as you can see in this cartoon image, matter is going to start spinning around some, a hot center, a hot central ball of gas that eventually will get so hot that it will start burning fuel. It will start fusing hydrogen in the center. This is when we say a star is born. A star is officially born on these hot bonds of gas, contract to the point where things get so hot that fuel can be burned. And remember, and something I'm going to repeat in this uh, lecture series, is that modern cosmology and astrophysics has shown us that when the universe was formed, it was just hydrogen and helium, the lightest elements in nature, mostly hydrogen. So the whole question and the whole point of this lecture series is to, to convey to you how we get from just hydrogen and helium to us, and to heavy elements, to carbon, oxygen, silicon, things with gold, things we use in our jewelry, everything, iPhones. So this is a cartoon image, this is a description of how stars are born. And what stars are born, they're born a different, with different properties. And we try to measure, and I'm not going to get too technical here, I'm just going to, that's why I have this beautiful beach team, as I'm from Greece, so we love our beaches. So uh, I'm not going to get too technical, but I'm going to say to you that most of the stars we see in our galaxy, for example, the vast majority of the stars, have sizes about the same as our sun. Pretty much the same, boring one solar mass stars, or a little bit less, a little bit more, but more, the majority of the stars are like that. It's kind of looking at a picture of pebbles in the, in the beach, where you will see a lot of little grains sand, uh, sand of grain, grains of sand, and a lot of smaller rocks, but occasionally will be some bigger rocks. And those are the stars I care about the most. It's 5% of stars that are massive, that are bigger. Are 8, 10, 15, 20 times, even more, and I'm going to get to that later, the mass of the sun. Those are the minority who tend to do a lot of work in the universe. So, stars are born in clouds of, uh, of gas. A protostar is born. And then, depending on its mass, how, how big, uh, how massive it is, it's going to have a different life. To make things simple, stars that are bigger, this minority of stars that are bigger, they live shorter lives. Because, I, mean, I like to compare it with people that are unhealthy, maybe obese, you know. They tend to exhaust their fuel faster than stars that are smaller. Because every, all that keeps the stars shining is this constant battle between energy and pressure that's generated in the internal of the star, in the core of the star, pushing outwards, and gravity trying to push it inwards. And the whole life of a star is maintaining balance between the two opposing forces of gravity and pressure. This is what this cartoon is uh, trying to convey here. So you just see a picture, an image uh, of the drawing of a star. You see the core of a star. We're zooming in to the core of a star. What we see here is that you have a massive star that has a lot of mass that's trying to pull things inwards. And as it tries to do so, you can imagine things get really hot and, uh, and dense in the core. The more you try to squeeze something, the hotter and denser it's going to get, especially hot gas, the hotter and denser it's going to get in the core. And the hotter and denser it gets in the core, the more efficiently it can burn fuel, it can burn hydrogen to, to form other elements that I'm going to talk about. So that's how we keep it star sun. Pretty much our sun. It's about 5 billion years old right now, and it's been doing that for about 5 billion years. It's been balancing out pressure and gravity for 5 billion years, and it's probably going to keep doing that for another 5 billion years, we think. And when that balance, for some reason, is disturbed, then something is going to happen. The star is either going to expand if pressure wins, or it's going to contract if gravity wins. One of the two. Until equilibrium, until balance can be reestablished under different conditions, or not. So, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of pressure. Because 
when we study stars, it is important to understand what supports them. And there is different kinds of stars, different kinds of points in the light of the star. And there's different kinds of pressures that are important. There's basically two kinds of pressures that we care about in stellar evolution. The regular thermal pressure, when you try to compress a gas, is going to exert uh, you know, a resistance when you're doing so. The thermal pressure and the quantum pressure. Now, that's a very, very complicated, very uh, deep subject. And I'm not going to get too much into it, but I do want you to understand the differences between the two. When it comes to thermal pressure, when you heat a gas up, it's going to heat up, the temperature is going to go up, and it's going to expand. When you take energy, when you cool it, the, the gas, it's, the temperature is going to go down. This is how normal pressure works, and this is how normal pressure works in, uh, in stars as well. But then there's a special kind of type of uh, conditions that you squeeze particles in such high densities that atoms are crossed with each other and you have you bring atoms so close together that you start getting into a different regime the regime of quantum pressure and this is pressure supported by electrons or neutrons some of the building blocks of uh, of our uh, of matter itself so the difference between the two, one, the main difference between the two is that quantum pressure does not depend on the temperature. Uh, you can heat something up. If you have a star that's supported by quantum pressure, okay, you, if you keep heating it up, it's not going to expand as a normal gas, as a normal star would. It's going to blow up. It's going to explode by a supernova explosion. This is a very fundamental difference between the two. Same, half, same holds for removing energy or removing temperature uh, from, uh, from normal versus uh, quantum. So there are some stars out there that I'm going to talk about because they're important for some types of supernova explosions we call white dwarfs. A white dwarf is basically the compact remnant, what's left over, the naked core of a low mass star that lost its outer envelope. So our sun, for example, will end up becoming a white dwarf at some point. Five billion years later, the outer envelope of the star is going to be expelled, and what's going to be left over, the bright, hot core of the star, made primarily of carbon and oxygen, that is going to be cooling down for billions of years. And that, that, whole, that hot star, that hot core, is what we call a white dwarf and it's supported by quantum pressure. So if you take a white dwarf and you heat it up somehow, and you add mass or pressure to it, it's not going to expand as a normal star. It's going to explode. Very important point that we're going to come back to later. So there is a dividing line in terms of mass. And I do want to emphasize that the determining factor of how a star is going to end up and what kind of life it's going to have to leave. There's more factors, but the, the, the main one is its mass, how big it is. And there's, we have determined in astrophysics that there is a dividing line above eight times the mass of the sun, which is what we use to define a massive star. So in these lectures, whenever I talk about massive stars, I usually talk about stars that are definitely above 8 to 12 solar mass. Anything below that is a low to intermediate mass star. That's the terminology I'm going to be using. Uh, so uh, most of these massive stars above eight solar masses are mainly supported by thermal pressure throughout. So that's the main component that keeps those. Yes, yes, sir. You said the white uh, dwarf only uh, uh, is maintained and supported by. Uh, Quantum pressure. Quantum pressure. Mm -hmm. What can you say about its, its temperature? Is it, is it changing? Or? Well, it's actually a very good question. Uh, the temperature of the, of the white dwarf when it's warm, it's pretty boring. It's pretty isothermic. It's the same, more or less. Uh, of course, as you go to the center, it gets a little hotter. But if you were to look at how it varies inside the star, it's, it's for the most part, it's pretty much the same. So this is a very, it's kind of like a, a, a body 
a, a homogeneous body that has the same temperature everywhere, in a sense. And if you keep adding you know, matter to it, then you can heat it up and do some interesting stuff with it. But when it's formed, it just has one temperature, basically. And we have a white dwarf type one H supernova expert in the crowd. Uh, so, and then you have lower mass stars below eight solar masses, like our sun, that will end up forming those white dwarfs, some form of a pump pressure. And so their lives will be an interplay between gravity and thermal versus quantum pressure, depending on what states of their lives they're in. When they get to, to make a white dwarf, it's going to be quantum pressure. When they're just regular stars living their regular lives, burning hydrogen in the course, it's going to be mainly thermal pressure. Uh, so let's get a little bit deeper into this issue of uh, fundamentals of stellar evolution and how do stars shine. I, I really think this is important for us to set the stage for supernova explosion. And this is a, a nice image that I got from uh, my ex supervisor, my PhD supervisor from UD Austin, Craig Wheeler, called the catastrophe book, uh, kind of illustrates what exactly is going on. So the whole thing is why is it hard to keep a star signing? Well, it's hard because, as I said before, you need to provide this internal pressure. To do that, you need to fuse elements together. You need to get light elements, bring them really close, bring those atoms really close to each other to the point where they can fuse and make a heavier element. Well, that's a hard process because atoms are made of, as most of you might know, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And you know, protons are charged particles. They have a positive charge. What happens if you try to bring positive charge really close to each other? They repel each other. There is charge repulsion. Protons don't like to get close together. There's charge repulsion. So you have to fight this repulsion in order to get two atoms close enough to fuse and form something else. But if you do bring them close enough at a very short, short range, then there's strong force. Uh, they combine. There's, uh, there's a short range attraction. And once you get through that threshold, you bring them together, you fuse them into a new element. You bring two hydrogen atoms. One of the, each one of these has a proton, an electron. You bring them close together, you fuse them, you make a deuterium atom. You do it over and over again, and eventually you make a helium atom. And then you try to do the same thing with helium, which is heavier than hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, silicon, and so on and so forth. This is what stars do. They run out of one light fuel, they contract, because if you run out of fuel, gravity is going to temporarily win, as I said before. The star is going to start contracting. But then what happens if the star uh, starts contracting? It's going to get hotter. And as it gets hotter, it will be able to burn this heavy fuel that it made before to something even heavier. Uh, but that's not going to go on forever. That, in massive stars, will only go on until you make iron. Iron is a very special element. It's comprised of 26 protons and 30 neutrons. It's a very special configuration, and its property is that, as we use this jargon in, uh, in physics, endothermic. You must put energy in to break iron to small pieces. So once you have a massive star eventually form an iron core, there's not really much you can do. No matter how you heat it up, the thing is going to contract and it's going to explode as a supernova explosion. This is, oh, this is all that we'll care about uh, for a lot of lectures, is making this iron core in the center of the star and seeing what happens to it once you make it. So th and, and this picture, if you imagine that initially you have a line of hydrogen, you bury it down, you make helium in the core, Star contracts, then you start burning, burning helium, and then you start making oxygen, carbon, and eventually iron. If you think about it, yeah, it looks like an onion. So that's what we call the onion structure. Eventually, when the star, when a massive star is old enough, you will have layers of different composition as you go inside the star, with the heaviest elements residing in the center and the lightest elements in the outer layers. 
So the outer layer of the star will have hydrogen and helium, which was there before. But as you go deeper, you will eventually get to iron, to the iron core. This is the, uh, this is the uh, onion structure, as we call it. So, but again, remember, that happens because the transition between making the different layers happens when this balance is disturbed. Because you lose pressure, and gravity starts pulling things together. It's all, it's all about the interplay between pressure and gravity that creates this structure. So, I don't want to get too deep into that, but it is the most important plot, the most important diagram in stellar astrophysics. Uh, it's kind of like demographics. It's kind of like going out in the public and you know getting demographic data for different people, uh, different backgrounds. And this is exactly what this plot is about. If you go, if astrophysicists like to go out and collect data and measure luminosities, remember all we have in the science really is light. Everything we try to understand about how things work, light thousands, millions of light years away, comes from light that we analyze in very sophisticated ways and we try to interpret why it is the way it is. So we'll talk about that in lecture number two. So this is a very, if you think about it, it's a very challenging science. Because you really try to decipher all the information we know about stars and supernova and galaxies out of light. And out of the information that physics tells us about how light works. So if you go out in the sky and look at different stars and measure how bright is the star, how bright is that star, how bright is the star. And also measure how hot it is, which we can do in a... There's several ways to do it by taking spectra. I'll, I'll talk about it in lecture number two. Then you can make this plot. And you can see there's a lot of stars that are concentrated in this strip that goes across the middle that we call the main sequence. Right here. This is where most, most stars we see in our galaxy reside right now. In terms of how bright they are and how hot they are. And this is where our sun lives. And that goes back to what I said in the beginning, that most of the stars are typically close to the mass of the sun, and they spend a lot of time fusing hydrogen into helium. Billions of years. Most of the star's life is spent at the first stage of fusing hydrogen into helium. They spend the majority of their life there. And that's why most of the stars we see happen to live in this this area right here. But there's, there's more. There's a few stars that are bigger, hard, giants and supergiants. There's a few stars that are uh, bigger. So, and those are very important. So, in astrophysics, we've been trying to understand this plot for a lot, for, for a lot of years. You know, we build careers out of understanding how this works and why it looks the way it is. Yes, sir? Please, um, in this uh, project, you then say that the sun, the sun, is a star. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, we build careers trying to understand this plot and why it looks the way it is. And this is, and I'm not going to go into that, but this is what we came up with. We had to model what happens specifically in each little part of the star as a function of time using the physics that's necessary to do this. Everything from quantum physics, nuclear physics, thermodynamics. Astrophysics is one of the few fields that has problems that combine a lot of different disciplines of physics together. That makes it a lot very challenging. Actually, supernovae, especially corpora supernovae that we talk about, it's one of the few fields that combines all aspects of physics, basically, uh, to understand. Like, it's a very, very sophisticated process. So what we needed to do is solve, try to figure out how things change in every part of the star of time. And that's very complicated physics. You need to solve a lot of equations simultaneously about how different fuels are burned differently, how the temperature changes, how the pressure changes. And you can't really do that in pen and paper. You'd be crazy to even try. You can do some basic map of the angle of the star, stuff to understand the global properties of stars. If you really want to understand how stars evolve, you got to learn 
program. So a lot of what we do in modern theoretical astrophysics, actually our daily lives is mostly programming. We're programmers. We know languages. We put all the physics and the equations that we think describe what happens in the star in the form of programs, sophisticated programs, codes, and we run those codes to do simulations, try to see whether what we predict is what we see. And that's the whole point of theoretical astrophysics. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Uh, we try, we need to be able to predict what we see. And this is one of the tools that I'm using. It, it's really a wonderful tool that has been evolving over the last 10 years. The MESA code, it's called, it stands for Modules for Experiments in Stellar Astrophysics. And the jargon is it's, it's a computational stellar evolution 1D code that solves for all complicated physics involving interiors of stars. What that means, basically, is that we take a simple model, model of the star. We, we assume the star is a, is a sphere. They look like spheres. They're not really spheres, though, and that's something I come back later to. But we assume they're spheres for simplicity, and we break the star down into small pieces, and then we see how things change in each, of, each one of those pieces, how temperature, pressure, composition changes in one of those pieces, and how that changes over time. And that is what this code does. It's open source. We're big fans of open source science. This can be downloaded by anyone, even if you're not a scientist. It can be run online. And the cool thing about it is that, which makes it very efficient, is that the guy who wrote the code is the guy who created PostScript and PDF for Adobe. He's a programmer. He's a millionaire. And he decided, oh, astrophysics is pretty cool. I'm just going to team up with some astrophysicists and write this wonderful tool. And now this is the leading stellar evolution code in the world. And this is something we've been using to tackle a variety of problems related to <coughs> astrophysics, <laughs> including stellar evolution, of course, how we get to supernova explosions and other more complicated, uh, more complicated uh, stuff. You can do a lot of stuff with it. And this is what comes out of this code. If you put it in and you run it, so what you do is you start with some assumptions. And you say, let's suppose we have a one solar mass star, okay? And let's start from the time it's born and see what happens over time. We put our assumptions, one, for example, we say this is the mass of the star is one solar mass. We say what uh, the initial composition of the star is, metallicity, as we say. We can say, does it rotate, for example? Because a lot of stars actually rotate, and that's very important. Uh, so we can set the initial conditions and then see what happens. And this is what comes out if you're right. It's a, it's, this is going to be a video, and I'm not going to focus on all the panels that you see here. I do want to focus a little bit on the lower right panel and on this panel, which is the the most important plot in astrophysics, Hertzberg Russell diagram, uh, the theoretical Hertzberg Russell diagram. So, here, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use this code, MESA, to evolve a star of one solar mass, basically our sun. And what you're going to see in the lower right is this is going to be a movie. And what you're going to see in the lower right panel is uh, initially you have hydrogen, this yellow line here is hydrogen, and this blue line here is helium. And, you're going to see, and this is the, the center of the star. As you go from zero to one, this is zero solar masses, this is one solar mass. So this is, you see what happens inside the star. And this is the core right here. And up here, you see how the luminosity and the temperature of the star evolves over time. So you will see that if you run this simulation, let me do that. You see, you start burning things, hydrogen is burned out, you make a helium core. And eventually, you're going to get hot enough that you're going to start burning helium. This yellow line right here is going to go down, and you're going to start forming something heavier, carbon monoxide in this case. Look what, look what happens to that the star. It's pretty complicated. Like, there's a lot of things going on right now, but basically what I'm trying to convey is that you start from hydrogen and helium, and you make this guy right here. By the time you make it, it's lost half of its mass because stars do lose mass as they evolve. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's made a carbon oxide white dwarf. And this is how the star evolved over time in terms of luminosity and uh, 
and temperature. And that looks very similar, especially you know that line right here, the main sequence line, very similar to the hertzfeld russell diagram, the observational hertzfeld russell diagram I showed before. Now, the picture is way different if you look at a massive star. And here's an example of a, of a star that's 15 times more massive than the sun. Uh, that star over here is going to get started with hydrogen and helium, but then it's, gonna, it's not going to stop on carbon and oxygen and make a white dwarf. It's going to keep burning until it makes an iron core. And the way it evolves in terms of luminosity, brightness, and temperature is different than, way different than what it was for a uh, for one of our stars. So you can see you've already made carbon oxygen right here, and boom, now we made silicon and sulfur in the center, which are heavy elements. They're heavier than carbon oxygen. Eventually, you're going to make iron, and that's when things stop. And that's when that's that's what you get. That's the structure you're going to get now. Not that one right here. That's the core. So those this blue and red line. Basically, it shows the composition of iron. This is all iron. The inner 1.4, 1.5 solar masses is iron. This is what sets the stage for a supernova explosion. This is how a star looks, or we think it looks, at least in this simplistic prescription of 1D, of spherical symmetry. This is what we think it looks before it, it's about to die and become a supernova. Well, things are difficult. You know, very easy to say, oh, let's take a star and evolve it. But as I said before, stars rotate. And they have magnetic fields. You know, and all these very complicated processes that take place in the star because of rotation of magnetic fields change the picture dramatically in some cases. So why it changes the picture dramatically? Because if you have a star that rotates around its axis, it's mixing things differently. It's like steering a pot. Or whatever. It's mixing elements differently. So it can bring up material from the outside that, as I said before, it's low, lighter material, like hydrogen helium, can dredge it back into the inside where things are hotter and can reinvigorate burning. So it can prolong his life. The stars that rotate can prolong their lives by cheating, by just bringing a few extra acids, elements from the outside in, in the core and reburning them. Recycling, they're the bigger cyclers. Uh, and they evolve in a quite a different and dramatic way. I'm not going to focus on these plots a lot. Uh, this is just to show and that this starts on magnetic fields, and we actually can predict how magnetic fields evolve over time and how the rotation of the star evolves over time. And as you will see, the evolution of the star, and again, I'm not going to focus here in detail. When it rotates, it's mixing things in a more efficient way. So it produces a different structure before it goes supernova than stars that do not rotate or rotate very slowly. It's very important. And I think this is a point, uh, uh, this is probably the only way you're going to see in this, <laughs> this lecture series, trying to keep things simple. But when we study stellar evolution, there's uh, three basic back of the envelope time scales which you can consider without even having to do those complicated one-dimensional simulations or just running this complicated code that I just showed you. You basically want to know what happens and in what and how long it happens when the balance is broken in a star's life. And there's different ways to break the balance. Well stars can collapse under the just under the influence of gravity. And I don't core, as I said before, it can just collapse under the influence uh, of gravity. And by doing so, it's going to become an, it's gonna make an explosion. So we have a so-called free-fall time scale, which basically tells you how many years, seconds, months, it will take a certain <coughs> ball of gas, a certain star, to implode under the influence of just gravity. So pressure now is irrelevant. The thing just collapses under the influence of gravity. And that basically depends on the, on the density of the star. Now, there's another important time scale which I basically talked about, but I didn't call it that, uh, thermal adjustment or Kevin Helmholtz time scale, which tells you how long it will take for a star to readjust its balance once the fuel is burned. So when you exhaust hydrogen, as I said, the star is going to try to contract, to get hotter, to start burning heavy elements. 
the time it takes to do that is the thermal adjustment time scale. And then basically it depends on how bright and how massive the star is. Uh, and then of course, we, know, we want to know how long stars live. And as I said in the beginning of the lecture, more massive stars live shorter lives than <clears throat> lower massive stars. For example, our sun is going to have a lifetime of about 10 billion years. A star that's about 10, 15 uh, times the mass of the sun will have a lifetime that's less than a billion years. 700 million, 800 million years. Much shorter lifetime. And the, the thing that basically determines how, how uh, long the star lives is the rate at which it burns its fuel. And massive stars, of course, because they you know, have more pressure and gravity, burn their fuel faster. Uh, they're more aggressive consumers. And basically, as I said before, it depends on the, on the mass and the luminosity. So we have these three important time scales that we can, in the back of the envelope, solve for any system to figure out its state, what's going on. You know, free-fold time scale, thermal adjustment time scale, and nuclear time scale. But, stars, when you start with the sun, the sun is not going to stay in the same mass every time. There's processes out in the outer layers of the star that remove, by the radiation, they remove mass from the star over time. So this is a, you can do this in two different ways. It's mass loss. Most stars do it in a quiescent way. Over millions of years, they slowly expel solar, a gentle solar wind, which over millions of years, of course, means they lose a lot of mass. If you remember the first movie I showed you from the evolution of a, a mass, a star, a one solar mass star, by the time it got to the final point, it lost about half of its mass. And this is the, the process, the left right here. It's a smooth, radiatively driven wind under which a lot of stars lose, lose mass. Because the further you go out in the star, the less gravitationally bound it is, the less uh, bound gravity is. So you can easily remove material that's further out than material that's deeper in the star, obviously. Uh, and this is how one way the star goes fast. But then there's other exciting, I love this picture. This is one of my favorite images uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope in uh, natural physics. Some stars are just not quiet, you know, they're, they're kind of cranky. And uh, by the time they get uh, really old, they get crankier. And by the time they get there, they start puffing out material in non quiescent ways. So suddenly you're going to have a star that's doing this, and suddenly pff, it, it pulsates and removes an outer envelope, the outer envelope of the star, in an episodic way. That's why we call it episodic mass loss. Well, mass loss is very important for supernova, which is the topic of this couple of lectures here. Because it sets the stage into which supernova occur. So supernova do not just blow up, usually, around clean space environment. They blow up within something that looks like that. So if the star is right here, and it's going to die, it's going to explode, it's going to blow up within this very complicated geometrically structure, this bipolar structure in this case. And there's more structures out there that look different, that have different geometries. And all this is going to matter, eventually, on how the supernova is going to look like. Because supernova is going to interact with this material. And its luminosity is going to change. And temperature is going to change. So mass loss is very important for supernova, especially for, for the brightest, which is going to be one of the last lectures we're going to talk about. And now, I know I said before that we may simplify assumptions to use these computer codes like we assume there's spheres, you know, spherical clouds, the usual nerd joke we use all the time. But in reality, real stars are not spherical. I mean, they are close, but not really. And that slight divergence from, from spherical symmetry makes a whole lot of difference in some cases. So what I'm going to show you here is a movie that we made with my collaborator, Sean Couch, and a few other collaborators from, uh, from uh, Arizona, University of Arizona. Sean was also a member of last Sunday, and now he's a professor at the uh, State. And we've been working together on a few projects using the FLAS code, the code that we developed with the FLAS Sunday. 
So the movie I'm going to show you here is a movie we've made using that code. It's a simulation, trying to see what happens inside the star as the star gets closed, collapsing. So at this point, before I even run the movie, I want to describe to you what we see in those panels. In the lower right panel, you will see iron. So the darker the color is, the more iron there is. So basically what you see here is the iron core. In the upper right panel, you see the, the other layer around the iron, the onion structure, right? The, which is going to be silicon. So you see that there's a cell of silicon sitting on top of uh, the iron core. And then there's other light elements outside. Here in this panel, that's going to be a very cool panel right here on the top left. You're going to see how the lot, how speed, how how fluid moves before you get to the explosion. You know, that it moves very little. You would think if the thing collapses, everything just goes down. So the velocity and the speed just points inwards. Well, not really. And then don't worry about this uh, lower light <laughs> left uh, <laughs> panel. It's, it just shows how how much energy is burnt as the thing goes on. So I'm going to run this movie now. And you will see up here that you start developing this departure from fluidity. You see what we call convection. You see motion that's not inwards right before you collapse, but it's making this hurricane-like movement. It looks like a kind of little hurricane right here. And you see, like, this is very important because those hurricanes, those convective eddies in jargon, they bring down material from the outside, like from silicon. They bring it down to the hotter inner regions, and they reinvigorate and they burn it. So if you, if you look at the star right now, it doesn't look that spherical anymore, does it? You know, there's all this complicated structure, and there's all this complicated large-scale structure on the outside. It's not just a ball of sphere that goes in. And that's very important, because when you want to do supernovae and you want to understand how stars explode, you need to start with the right initial conditions. Initial conditions are very important in solving physics problems. And for years now, we've been starting with the wrong initial conditions. We've been assuming the stars are spherical, you know. And we, we, we learned something from that. It's not like it was useless. But you can learn way more if you do multidimensional, as we call them, simulations. Real stars are three-dimensional. So you need to, to break a star down in a three-dimensional way in small pieces and and try to understand it wholly as a, as a three-dimensional object. So once you do that, then you can start looking into more realistic approaches to the supernova problem. But the thing is that to do that, it's very expensive. Uh, not monetarily too, but uh, mainly computationally. Because we're no longer just making simplified assumptions for codes that we can run in our laptops. We can't run this thing, we can't run this simulation, this multi-dimensional simulation in my laptop or in my desktop computer right here. We need supercomputers. We need machines that bring together hundreds of thousands of processors, give us the computing power that we need to be able to, to run those simulations. And I'm going to come back to that in the last lecture, actually. I'm going to talk about supercomputer simulations. And actually, the University of Chicago is a great place to be in terms of that because Argonne National uh, Lab is here, and they have one of the biggest <coughs> supercomputers in the world, Mira, the Mira supercomputer, which we've been using to do things like that with my collaborators. So it's a good place to be. So <coughs> this is we're getting close to the end, but I want this picture. I, I'm not gonna. I don't want you to remember the numbers and the, the symbols and everything, but I want you to remember. Coming back to my initial point, that 95% of the stars are like our sun, smaller size, maybe a little bigger, but they're not massive stars. They're low to intermediate mass stars. Which means that if we want to study stellar death and supernovae, most of the stars that are going to produce this are going to be white dwarfs. They're going to be the remnants from these low mass stars. And then there's going to be this 5%, which is going to make a huge whole difference. So what this shows is the mass of a star. So you can start from really small stars, 0 0.01, 1% 1 of the mass of the star, or of the sun. And you can go up sometimes to really, really massive stars, 100 times, 200, 300 times the mass of the sun. 
But you will see that most of the stars, the vast majority, this is kind of like a percentage, 8%, 9%, 100%. The vast majority of the stars <coughs> are around here. Less than 10 solar masses or 8 solar masses. And then there's this, this guy. Who, we're not going to make white dwarfs. We're going to make neutron stars and black holes. Pretty exciting objects that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, <coughs> so, to summarize and give time for questions and answers, this is kind of like a takeaway point. Is you all should have in your uh, uh, handouts. <coughs> So stars are born with different masses. Most stars are low mass. The life of the star depends heavily on how massive it is. Majority of the stars I said are, you know, like our star, are going to make white dwarfs. But then it's going to be this 5%, which is going to make a huge difference in supernova. This, the, star, the stars live because of the constant battle between pressure and gravity. Gravity tries to pull it inwards, and pressure tries to expand it. And that balance is occasionally broken leading to either contraction or expansion. When you contract that star, and you push it together, it gets hard. It's going to burn fuel. It's going to burn heavier fuel, and so on and so forth, eventually making this onion-like structure, where the heavier material is in the inside, and the lighter material is in the outside. And eventually, massive stars are going to make iron cores, and then there's no more. <coughs> then the iron core is doomed to collapse, to produce a supernova. So, massive stars live shorter lives, and involve different Lagoma stars. And it's important to understand that to understand how stars evolve and get to the point where they become supernovae, we have to employ modern computational facilities and modern codes like MESA and FLASH in order to tackle this problem appropriately. And this is what my career is about, is using these tools and, and extending these tools appropriately to understand how these things happen. And of course, when you do that, you realize, oops, real stars are not actually spheres. You know, there's a lot of complicated structure before you get a supernova. And it turns out to be very important on the impact it has on supernova explosions. Thank you. Yes, in addition to computational codes, are there observational tools that we have that we didn't have before that allow us to know more than we ever knew? About supernovae in yeah. general? Yes, for sure. Very Can good question. Touch upon that? Yeah, yeah. So we go hand in hand. You know, sometimes they like to think of theories as kind of like the cult that's isolated from the rest of the world doing their own thing. But we actually, in this field, we go hand in hand. We have modern automated facilities, and Max is going to have a lecture on that uh, later, which little robotic telescopes that scan the sky in a nightly basis. So what they do is, you don't even have human input at this point. It's all automated. So those, those little telescopes, they scan the sky in, in stripes every night, and they go back to the same point, and they take pictures in high frequency. And then they compare the previously taken picture from the same region with the picture they just took, and they see if there's something different. So they compare those pictures and say, oh, did something happen there? You know, and if there's a new light that wasn't there before, it's possible it's a supernova explosion. And this is a very efficient way right now. We're using major projects around the world, and the U.S. is leading the pack with great projects in California and uh, Harvard to discover supernova. We actually discover thousands of supernova right now on a daily basis. We don't even know what to do with them. <laughs> Have a lot of data sets around. <coughs> yes. Uh, you've been talking about uh, countless countries. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, so, massive stars, as I said, are going to just make up to iron by a fusion process. However, when, uh, and I'm going to get back to that later, when a supernova explosion takes place, then you have uh, processes where you can capture radiation in a very efficient way, and you can break down heavy elements by a nuclear fission. For example, uranium, you're going to make uranium eventually when the supernova happens by a very complicated process called our process, rapid capture process. Uh, and the heavier nuclei, the heavier elements you, you make, the more unstable they are. So they're more prone to fusion. That will happen eventually after you have a supernova. Mm -hmm. So that happens to me. Yeah. If uh, the MESA program was modified to include variables from dark energy and dark matter, would you expect that it would alter the predictions of stellar evolution or not? 
No, uh, because uh, dark matter plays a very important role in dark energy in a large scale, cosmological large scale. So if we go down the scale of the star, the dark matter is not really contributing at all. But, but, we think there is a new theory out there that in the beginning of uh, time, when you had the, uh, the Big Bang, uh, shortly after the Big Bang, when you start making the first stars, some of the first stars could have been supermassive. We're talking about stars that would be like one million times the mass of the sun. That's a huge star. And when you start talking about this day of the star, then you start you need to start worrying about that matter. But that's only appropriate in this very early stage. Here. So what we do here, quarter stars, that matter is not going to happen. Thank you. For yeah. Okay. Yes. So the. <clears throat> That last simulation, was that a 2D picture of a 3D model? That was an actual 2D. We've we'll also done 3D. Okay. That was a 2D. We've done 3D because 3D is much yeah. more expensive. For example, to run a three-dimensional simulation like the one I showed you, we spent 18 million computer hours, which means that if you were to run it here, it would take 18 million hours <laughs> to complete. That's why we need to do it here. So the, the other thing is, do they correct rel relativistic effects? Are you are you painting? Uh, you mean general relativistic or special relativistic? Well, for the general relativistic effects due to gravity and so forth, does that have a significant impact on evolution? Well, it doesn't have an evolution at this level, but it does uh, collapse. So when you once you actually get yeah, to the outer core the last seconds, right? then grant, you know the general relativity effects are included, and actually that's that's part of, that goes back to what I said that the core collapse problem is. One, the most complicated problem is astrophysics because it has everything from quantum physics to <laughs> general activity anything. Go to models. Models have that built in. But also, in terms of the supernova, I, I'll, I'll talk later about that. You have stars that are born together and they the binary system they rotate out of time. In some cases, those stars are going to produce really, really dense uh, white dwarfs or black holes, and those are called LEDs. You know, and in this case, obviously, general relativity is very important. In the, in the late stage evolution of massive binary systems, for example. And I'm going to touch on that in a later lecture. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you stand by? That's a very good question, young yeah, man. Uh, well, we estimate uh, approximately 10,000 uh, supernova happening a day. Yeah. We don't see all of them. There's probably more. We don't see all of them. But we see a lot now. In what? In, a, in other galaxies. So we are overdue. In one galaxy. Yeah, but we're overdue in our galaxy uh, in terms of having a of supernova. You know, we thought the rate of having a supernova occurring in our galaxy would be like once every century approximately. And we're way overdue right now. So we think perhaps Beetlejuice can do us a favor and blow up. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Can you step back to the slide where you had three time scales? Yeah. <clears throat> there you go. Can you tell those variables? So that yeah, definitely. No, thanks for pointing out. Let me get the laser pointer. So, this is the only equations you're going to see. <laughs> but this is time in seconds or years. This is the gravitational constant. So that's a constant. This is density. Here, this is again a gravitational constant. This is mass, the mass of the star, the luminosity, the brightness of the star, and the radius of the star. How big it is, the radius of the star. Right here, what you have is again the mass the luminosity, the fraction of the star that's made up of a certain fuel, hydrogen, helium, and how much energy you need to break down this fuel. So this basically tells you the rate at which you burn fuel, how long you're going to be in this burning state. Yes, sir? <coughs> Maybe you said this, but what's the name of a person who did the MESA programming? Oh, uh, Bill Paxton. Look him up. He's a, he's a very famous programmer. And what is he doing now? He still works, he's at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where we have an active collaboration with, and he still develops the code. He's adding new features into the code as we speak. He's a, he's a genius. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, could you go back to the slide where you had the main sequence? The evolution or? Well, where you showed the. Uh, the medium. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Let me go back there. Right here? Yeah, over there. Now, uh, you're primarily, primarily interested in studying massive stars. Yes. So you're not that interested in that? Well, uh, ma even massive stars will spend some time here. Yes. It's just the time they're going to spend here is going to be much shorter than what a sun-like star is going to spend. Now, is that, is that our galaxy or is that the universe? No, no, no. This is star. This is that every single dot you, you, you see here. It's a star in our galaxy. Just on yeah. the galaxy. Yeah. And are you then studying uh, you know, a real interest in the outer reaches and the scattered out from the... Oh, yeah, those stars? are... That's, you say, you mean those outliers here? The outlying stars. Is that where your research is being uh, I love that. Actually, these are very important because you're going to make a special type of supernova, type 1 supernova explosion, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, but obviously, those are you know highly evolved stars. They're close to getting to the point where they're eventually going to collapse. So yeah, everything is important here, but being a supernova person, I do focus on these guys a lot. Can you give us one hint? What is so important about stars not being really spherical? What what difference does it make? Don't it make, get into it too much, but yeah, well, it makes a huge difference because when you want a star in terms of supernovae. When you want to start a supercomputer simulation of a supernova, you have to make some assumptions. And you have to put in those assumptions to your code to begin with. And if you start by assuming it's a 1D spherical object and make all the simplifying assumptions, you're going to get something, but it's not going to be correct. And actually, that's been a problem for years. We've been making models of massive stars and supernova that wouldn't blow up. You know, we would see stars exploding, and we wouldn't be able to do this in our computers. Like, what's wrong? Why? You know? And once we started, which that happened really over the last five, six years, and we had a big impact to it, and other groups uh, in Arizona have big impact in this field, but once you start considering those perturbations, those departures from symmetry, it makes a huge difference because you have excess energy stored into these eddies, into these uh, little hurricanes, that will make a difference once it starts to collapse and will exaggerate later. Yes? Are there any stars uh, that are stabilized by angular momentum? Well, angular momentum is, uh, is both a stabilizing and destabilizing factor, depending on how much it is. Uh, so it's a stabilizing factor because you will have the rotational support. If a star rotates, then you, know, you have this rotational support. But if you rotate too much, then you have centri strong centrifugal forces that will actually start removing mass around the equator. So, but there are actually stars out there that rotate very fast. They have breakup speed, as we call it. And we call it breakup speed because at this level, the star starts to lose mass out of so centrifugal stable. forces. It's not yeah. Stable. yeah. You have a question, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. What would you respond to the question? What is it actually the origin of source of stars? The origin of stars? Throughout the whole cosmos. The origin of stars? Is it, yes, is there, a, is there a force or mechanism by which these stars are distributed over the different galaxies? Well, uh, there are some distributions of stars in certain galaxies. So, for example, in our galaxy, stars tend to be concentrating in a disk, in a spiral disk. And there's other galaxies that are more like spherical. You know, they're more irregular. They're galaxies we call elliptical, where you have stars distributed in different ways. Uh, but that's also uh, a question of time, not just a question of space. It's a question of how things evolve. And galaxies evolve. Spirals change over time. Elliptical change to spiral sometimes. Uh, galaxies merge sometimes. And that will create a, a whole multitude of distributions of stars. You know, um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, the theoretical HR, that's time and, that, and, and luminosity, that's the past, the stars, and their 
lifespan? Yeah, so, theoretically. yeah, theoretically. So basically what's predicted by codes like Mesa that I, I, I saw you before is what we're going to think, in, how does the star move in this diagram as it moves? In terms of the temperature. Oh, the temperature or the time of the cloud? It's temperature. Oh, the temperature. It's always temperature and brightness. And here we call it color, but color really is an indication of temperature and observational. This is the difference between observers and the theorists. <laughs> yes? Um, so, what parameter do you think is mostly affected by the absence of uh, spherical symmetry? Is mixing. It's mixing. Mixing of material. Uh, as I said before, you bring elements, you dress down elements from the outer layers down in, in the core. That changes the structure, so it's a nonlinear effect. You know, it's going to change the structure and the composition, but that's also going to locally, you know, change the, the, the density and the, the temperature profile of the star. It's going to make cores smoother over time. And hey, what happens to the quantum pressure that you mentioned while the star is contracting? In what case? In the white board? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the quantum, well, quantum pressures try to support gravity, but eventually, uh, if you keep adding matter to it, you know, it's going to heat up and explode. But there are cases in more, more massive stars that initially they will go through a stage of short state, I wouldn't call it white dwarf, stage of electron degenerate pressure. That's very <laughs> jargonish. Uh, but they will be so massive that it will keep squeezing nuclei together and atoms together to the point where you, you will combine you know, electrons with, uh, with uh, protons you're going to make neutrons. I mean, neutron quantum pressure will be adequate to support gravity. But then if you, even if that pressure is not enough, then you're going to keep collapsing down to a black hole. Yes? So just one more. On the, on the 3D simulations, what's the state of the art now for the size of the, the volume and the time slice that those can consider? Well, uh, very good question. So, depending on what problem you, you're trying to tackle, you use a different uh, size of the grid. For example, if, you, if you're trying to look into the core collapse of the star, you don't care about what's going on up there. You just focus your code to just look in, into the iron core, the inner 1.42 solar masses. And that's, uh, that saves you computational, a lot of computational uh, hours. Now, if you care about things that happen on the outside, you know, when a shock, when a supernova blast wave breaks in the outer layers and the star blows up, then you can focus. You can sacrifice resolution in the center and focus on, on the other parts. Uh, and now, in, in terms of 3D, we can't really uh, yet run simulations that are, you know, in, in physical time longer than seconds, hours. You know, it's really expensive. So if you were, one of the reasons, I mean, we would like to evolve a star in 3D. That would be awesome. But <laughs> we are far from having those computers. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, a large density of suns that are uh, in the bottom quadrant, uh, quadrant over there. Yeah. It, does that imply that it takes longer to go through that state? Because I, mean, I, I, I mean, the fact that there's more density, I, I know that we accept that that's common being the main sequence. Yeah. But that there's a, because there's a conglomeration of more places, that because that's, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So basically, stars spend a lot of their time, most of their lives, Using hydrogen helium, so they spend a lot of time here. So that's why, and most of them are low mass stars, and that's why you still. So if, if I relate these, because I've, I've been trying to relate the theoretical and the observational. Yeah. Then. So, note note to take is that here in the theoretical diagram, we don't plot many stars. We just plot single stellar evolution. We're trying to understand how a star moves around this block. So take one dot and see what happens over time. Understood. We, we saw that graph earlier, right? Yeah. We saw it live, but the super right. massive. Mm -hmm. saw so really, like each one of those lines is what we saw on the upper left exactly. corner for that one simulation. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would expect to see the white, because you said that like most of our stars, most of the stars are like the sun, right? Yeah. So we should be seeing a lot of white dwarfs because our sun is eventually heading towards the white dwarf. Yeah. But I mean, if that's true, shouldn't we see a lot of things toward heading in that? That yeah. white dwarf stage, but if we look at the graph on the right, we well, see anything that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is, a, that is an observational bias because mm -hmm. white dwarfs are dim. So it can be really hard to actually find them sometimes. Okay. So there are, there are a lot of out there, uh, probably. And you know, they also, it takes long for stars to get there. So a lot of stars haven't even get to that stage. When you look at the galaxy, 
a lot of stars simply haven't gotten that stage yet. They're still here, the main sequence. But and the ones that have gotten to that stage, this is how many we find, and probably a lot more. So that's just based on the age of our galaxy. That one? That, well, the, the fact that we don't see a lot of white dwarfs. That's related. Time scale is important. Yeah, that's related. Thank you. So about time scales. Yeah. So on this uh, concept of quantum pressure, um, you seem to suggest that uh, it's a function of how close together particles are. And so you must have some idea um, about how close it, become, it must be in order for this to yeah. become significant. Exactly. And then this is really the heart of what I'm trying to get at. And it may just be my misunderstanding, but everything in quantum mechanics that I've ever understood doesn't deal with positions, it deals with probabilities of finding something somewhere. And so how can you speak of position and distances? And is that something that you worry about in these computer simulations? No, I mean, uh, this is tiny. Uh, obviously, uh, you're talking about a high, uh, high squared and all that. But uh, in reality, eventually, you will. There's a probability density on where it's most likely to find a particle, right? But we, we can predict. You know, so uh, I'm going to get a little technical now. You can solve for the wave functions and the Schrodinger's equation and predict where the probability is higher to find a certain particle. Well, but then you have an arbitrary decision to make of how, how, how high a probability are you going to insist on before you say that anything, anything more than that is irrelevant. Is that true? Is that I mean, there's, there's, there's always going to be an associated uh, error, small error in terms of the distance, but you, you, you will get to a threshold where things are close enough together that, uh, you know, the source range is contraction. But in terms of the actual computation, you're dealing with we're not, no, we're not probability density. Yeah, and not an error. that's, yeah, so this is boiled in, in what we're doing, not in that level, we're not solving for uh, the storing situation, but it's boiled in the global level, what is the the actual pressure threshold that you need to get to in order for things to change to, to a quantum dominated pressure. Uh, and there is an answer for that. And, and, and the answer is it's under second mass. I'm going to talk about it in the second lecture. So it, the question is how much mass you can pack together to get to this degenerate state. Uh, and, uh, if, if you exceed that, that level by adding energy into it or heat, then things are going to explode. So we do put it in, it is boiled in the simulations, but not in the level that you're describing, which is good enough for us. Yeah. Isn't it based on the Pauli exclusion principle? Uh, that, yeah. That this, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. not a, a physical location, right. it's a probability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Real quick, uh, the uh, diagram is of our galaxy. Stars in our galaxy, not all the stars, stars in our galaxy, yeah. Right, right. Uh, do we know, do we just assume other galaxies have a similar profile? Can we see in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, uh, yeah there, there's bright nearby galaxies, Andromeda, for example, M33, the Triangle Galaxy, <laughs> where we've done the same thing. And we see very similar, I mean, those galaxies are in our neighborhood, so we do share similar properties in terms of how evolved they are, which is very important. And we do see the same thing. But now if we go further away, it's really hard to, to measure individual stars the further away you go. 